Oh, hello, Ribozo. What are you doing? Just making hemoglobin for you, good sir. Great. Wait, isn't that supposed to be glutamate instead of valine? Oh, tomatoes, tomatoes. It'll be fine. Oh, that nabbit. Making errors in biology is a pain in the butt, much like in computer science. Recognize a healthy cell as an infected one, boom, autoimmune disease. Cut off healthy DNA instead of a damaged one, there you go, cancer. The point is that living things have to be very accurate with recognition and error correction in order to even survive. So, I'm announcing a two-part miniseries where we'll be exploring the fascinating mechanisms that cells use to catch and correct errors related to their DNA source code. The next video will be about fixing the actual DNA itself, but in this video, we'll be discussing another crucial aspect of DNA, how cells decode DNA into proteins, the executors of biological functions. And as a bonus, we'll also take a look at how the principle of error correction applies to how our immune system recognizes infected cells. So sit back, relax, and let's dive in to the intricate world of error correction in living cells. As we've covered before, the central dogma is the process by which DNA encodes instructions for proteins that carry out cellular functions. This process involves the transcription of DNA into RNA by RNA polymerase and the translation of RNA into protein by ribosomes. The difference between RNA and DNA is that RNA uses a different backbone molecule and replaces thymine T with uracil U. The RNA polymerase recognizes the message on the DNA by pairing A with U and G with C. Since much like in DNA, A goes with T and G goes with C. The code on the RNA, AUGC, is then translated by the ribosome into specific amino acids that form the protein chain. Each specific amino acid is encoded using a three-letter stretch of RNA called a codon. For example, the codon AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. Amino acids, much like the bases that make up RNA and DNA, are what makes up the protein chain. Essentially, the ribosome is the translator that converts the language of RNA into the language of proteins. And that's the decoding process from DNA to proteins. Let's dive deeper into how the ribosome actually functions. Although it may seem like magic, the ribosome's mechanism is really cool and mechanical. Amino acids don't simply appear at the ribosome's doorstep, no, 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 but rather they are delivered by transfer RNAs, tRNAs. These tRNAs contain a sequence of three bases called anticodons that are complementary to the codon on the mRNA sequence. The tRNA serves as a translator between the language of RNA and proteins, while the ribosome acts as the cranker to assemble the protein chain. When a tRNA enters the ribosome, it binds to the mRNA and has the ability to also unbind due to the thermal motion of molecules, among other things, within living cells. The rate of unbinding is faster if it is an incorrect match, thus providing an inbuilt error correction mechanism. If the tRNA successfully binds, it can either leave or attach its amino acid to the growing protein chain. Looks simple enough, right? Well, if the cell actually works like this, it is going to be very, very error prone. This simplified model has a high error rate of 1 in 100 which is significant when considering the length of most proteins to be around 200 to thousands. Real ribosomes have an error rate of 0.01%, or 1 in 10,000, which begs the question, what do real ribosomes do differently than this simplified model? In reality, tRNAs are actually bound to another protein called EFTU, which also has a molecule called GTP attached to it, GTP is similar to ATP, but it uses G instead of A. 
when the tRNA arrives at the ribosome, it can base pair with the mRNA just like before, but it cannot attach the amino acid to the growing chain just yet. This is because the EFTU needs to use up the GTP to GDP, which is an irreversible step that consumes energy. This step also has another important consequence. Once the EFTU is in the GDP form, it cannot bind back to the ribosome if it decides to leave. And by simply adding this step, the error rate dramatically drops to 0.01%. This type of mechanism is known as kinetic proof reading. So why does this mechanism fix the errors? Why does spending energy have anything to do with correcting errors? Take a minute to think about it. Be sure to leave your guesses in the comments. So first, let's calculate the error if we didn't include EFTU. If it were the correct tRNA binding, it can bind back and forth with rates constants KC dash and KC. Likewise with incorrect binding, but KW dash is much higher than KC dash. KC and KW are relatively similar. Once bound, the tRNA can choose to unbind or commit to linking two amino acids together at the rate constant V. The following is where the error rate comes from. I'll define the error rate as incorrect over correct. The correct rate is the rate that the correct amino acid is added, which is V times CC. We can figure out what CC is by seeing how it changes over time. CC increases from the little and big C feeding in and decreases from dissociation and linking of the amino acids. The linking speed is pretty slow compared to the other terms, so we can get rid of it. And we'll also assume that CC is always in steady state, so it doesn't change. Doing a little bit of algebra, we can plug in CC into correct rate. And that's the correct rate. Do the same calculation for the incorrect rate, and we can just divide them to get the error rate. We can cancel a few stuff out. The amount of right and wrong tRNAs are approximately the same since the cell makes equal amounts of each pairing, and the rate that a tRNA enters the ribosome is roughly the same as you've seen earlier. So, plugging in the experimentally found values, we get an error rate of 0.01, .01 or 1%. Now, the part you'll be waiting for. The key to reducing this error is very subtle. The actual source of this error is in fact that the tRNA itself can bind and unbind as many times as it wants. For the EFTU bit, we'll add an extra stage called CC prime to signify that the GTP has been used up irreversibly. Before the GTP is used up, the tRNA can still bind and unbind freely, but when it is used up, it cannot bind back. And it's this inability to bind back that is the source of the reduced error. Adding an irreversible step, in a sense, gives another chance for the ribosome to question the validity of the tRNA. This isn't merely wordplay though, you can clearly see it in the math, as we'll see soon. We can use the same idea to figure out the error rate, but this time we'll use CC star times V instead of CC. We'll cancel out the same terms under the same assumptions. L prime and K primes are approximately the same since they both describe dissociation. So the error rate is the same as the previous case, but squared, hence the 0.01%. In fact, the more stages you add to it, the more you add to this exponential. Try proving that for yourself. The more irreversible stages you add, the more times you force that mechanism to question itself. And that is why the cell bothers to spend valuable energy in creating these irreversible steps. Hence why kinetic proofreading is so effective. Kinetic proofreading is so useful that it's used in a lot of places in the cell beyond just translation correction. One really cool place you can see this at work is the immune system, which uses kinetic proofreading to accurately detect infected cells with a 1 in a million error rate. Here's how the immune system recognizes an infected cell or a cancerous cells. Cells display a bunch of protein fragments on their surfaces called antigens, which could be from the cell itself or from the virus or from the tumor-related proteins. 
the immune system uses a type of immune cell called a killer T cell to detect and kill cells that display a specific type of antigen. Each T cell has a receptor that is specific to that antigen. The T cell reads the state of each cell by hugging around each cell and swiping the detectors along the surface. And these detectors are highly specific to one type of antigen. If the cells only display parts from the cell, the T cell doesn't get stuck to the cell, ignores it, and moves on. If that specific receptor sticks to the antigen display, however, the T cell goes into attack mode. If we were to perform the same calculation as earlier with the ribosome, the error rate would be at 10% minimum. And this is not even taking into account the fact that there is only one correct pairing and billions of incorrect ones. Without kinetic proofreading, we're all going to get autoimmune disease. The way that T-cells fix this is pretty clever. It's also another valid way of viewing kinetic proofreading. Each T-cell has an internal timer that activates the T-cell at a specific time. The timer works by having the inside signaling unit be phosphorylated a bunch of times before it can actually start sending signals. Chances are that the timer ticks off before the correct pairing unbinds, and doesn't tick before the incorrect pairing unbinds. Mathematically speaking, each receptor antigen interaction has a characteristic average duration it stays on for. The inverse of that is called the off rate. It is much higher for incorrect pairs. Each unbinding event is also independent, so the probability of unbinding follows an exponential distribution. Try to justify this to yourself by comparing it with radioactive decay. We can look at the probability that it remains bound after some time has passed by taking this integral. And we can compare the correct incorrect binding probabilities the same as before. Plugging the experimental values, we can see that the error rate is so low, at around 1 in a million chance. Isn't our immune system really cool? If you guys want me to start a new series on the math behind our immune system this fall, be sure to leave a comment down below. If we get to 5,000 likes on the video, I'll be more than excited to start making it. Be sure to join me next time in exploring how the cell fixes the actual DNA itself. But for now, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.